good morning. Good morning. Welcome back. For those watching us, uh, thanks for being here as well. Rejoin the ancient psalmist in proclaiming, enter his gates with thanksgiving and his courts with praise. Give thanks to him and praise his name, for the Lord is good and his love endures forever. So if possible, we, uh, we would like people to be here, but we understand there are health reasons for people to stay at home. So we want those who are at home watching again, either on Facebook or on YouTube, know we still love you, and we're happy that you're here with us at all. And uh, we hope the Lord blesses you the same way he's going to bless us this morning. I'm sure he will. Those of you who are here had the chance to pick up our bulletins. Uh, the bulletin is always posted if you need to in the South by Sandy dot, uh, Baptist dot org website. And we have just a couple of announcements here. Next week, it will be on September 7th and 8th, our Life and Life teaching time. We look forward to being back together. And uh, your bulletin will have more information in it. There's also an announcement in the bulletin about breeders. We want to get our breeders back on the schedule. We've been kind of doing it ad hoc over the last few months. Uh, it's an important job, and our breeders are the welcoming crew here on Sunday mornings. Out in the foyer, we have updates from two of our missions partners. Uh, we have copies from the Andrevex and from Joseph Jenga. They appreciate our support, both financially and in prayer. And again, if you're interested, pick up copies, take them with you. Are there any other announcements? Shall we pray? Lord, we thank you for bringing us here together. We thank you for being here with us. It's a wonderful time for us to be here. We ask that you would open our hearts and our minds to be receptive to your message, and that you would help us to stay awake, pick up the things that we have the opportunity to hear today. We ask that you would please be with Pastor Bob, too, as he delivers the message, that you would strengthen him and encourage him. Lord, let us just appreciate the time that we have together. We don't have our normal fellowship, but we can have it outside a little bit. But again, if nothing else, it will help us appreciate it when the time comes when we can do it again. So please be with us this morning. We ask this in your name, Lord Jesus. Amen. Would you please take your common worship insert and follow along as I read the call to worship. Do you know that when we worship together, we are joining in a continual activity that spans time, space, and language? And they sing a new song saying, You are worthy to take the scroll and to open its seals because you were slain. And with your blood you purchased for God persons from every tribe and language and people and nation. You have made them to be a kingdom and priests to serve our God, and they will reign on the earth. Then I looked and heard the voice of many angels, numbering thousands upon thousands, and ten thousand times ten thousand. They encircled the throne and the living creatures and the elders. In a loud voice they were saying, Worthy is the Lamb who was slain, to receive power and wealth and wisdom and strength and honor and glory and praise. Then I heard every creature in heaven and on earth and under the earth and on the sea and all that is in them saying, to him who sits on the throne and to the Lamb, be praise and honor and glory and power forever and ever. Amen. From Revelation chapter 5. Let's stand together as we worship the Lord through song. I sing the mighty power of God.
As you're seated, if you could take the insert again and follow along. As I read, we renew our hearts before God. What is one characteristic we all share with sheep? We stray. Left to ourselves, we so easily wander off. We follow paths that often lead to us problems like sin, heartache, and confusion. The Bible says, we all like sheep have gone astray. Each of us has turned to his own way. Have you strayed? Turned to your own way? The shepherd is seeking you. Let's bow our heads now for a moment of silent confession. Forgive us for when we do stray. Forgive us when we try to do things on our own. Lord, we need you and we love you. Lord, thank you for this time that we can come together and encourage one another and be lifted up to learn more about you. Lord, bless our morning in Jesus' name. Amen. Now let us hear the good news. We all, like sheep, have gone astray. Each of us has turned to our own way. And the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. Isaiah 53, 6. The good news comes from the cross. Our great shepherd has found and rescued his sheep through his sacrificial death. Finding and rescuing us cost him his life. Now, because of his death and resurrection, wandering sheep are secure, loved, and always in his care.
the things that we need to do, the precautions that we need to observe. I think everybody who is here right now could tell you that um, this is a very safe place. We don't want people just to feel safe, we want them to be safe. And so we have good social distancing, we're asking people to wear masks, and um, I think that you can come with, with confidence. You know, one of the important things that you and I have to do in our lives in order to grow in the Lord is to be in God's Word on a regular basis. And there's lots of different ways we can do that. There's lots of ways we can feed that habit of being in His Word. But one of the ways that we provide for you here at South Bay Sandy is through a wonderful uh, study tool called um, Discovery, put out by a gospel, put out by Scripture Union. They've been publishing these for a long, long time, and it takes you through the Bible, going into various parts of the Bible. Uh, so the new quarter begins October 1st, and I love the format of this, of uh, prayer, reading the scripture, some meditation, some, some thinking about it. So these are available, as always, out in the foyer. You can take one with you today, so you'll be ready. If, if you're not here today and uh, you would like one of these, uh, I'd be glad to send one uh, to you. Well, then, this that our life and light is starting up again. That all came to a halt <laughs> suddenly, as everything did back in March. So I'm looking forward to that resuming. And that is our primary teaching time. That is a time where we intentionally spend time looking more deeply into God's Word, changing it up in order to provide for that spacing that we need, uh, children and youth on Wednesday night, and as you know, uh, adults on uh, Thursday night. And we are beginning, for our adults, we are beginning a, a study through a curriculum called Explore the Bible. Uh, we're, going to, we're going to begin the book of Isaiah. It's, it's going to be a great study, a great way to see the big picture of Isaiah, to see Jesus through Isaiah, to learn more about God through Isaiah. Uh, we will be meeting, for those of you who have, who have uh, signed up, you've contacted me, um, we will be meeting downstairs and uh, that way we can, we can spread out. We'll have a number of different we'll have tables set up down there and we'll be, we'll be spread out. And so I'm really looking forward to that time, again, for children and youth, Wednesday, October 7th at 6.30, and adults on Thursday evening, Thursday evening the 8th, uh, 6.30. We're going from 6.30 to 7.45 is, is going to be our, our time. In 2 Corinthians 6, the Apostle Paul talks about his own life and his own experience, the things that he has gone through, the things that he is going through. And one of the phrases there that has come to mean a lot to me, and Paul is actually speaking about himself when he says this, but he uses the expression, sorrowful, yet always rejoicing. Sorrowful, yet always rejoicing. And I'm reminded of, of that reality th this morning with the passing of our, our brother, Johnny Elgin. Johnny, after a long time of, of illness, living far longer than was the expectation of a year ago. Uh, Johnny went home to be with the Lord on Friday morning at 7.20. Sorrowful. I'm going to miss him. We're going to miss him. Beloved brother, truly sorrowful at that loss, but rejoicing. Rejoicing for him. Rejoicing because he loved the Lord Jesus Christ. Rejoicing because he was passionate about telling others about Jesus. Rejoicing that he now is with his, his Lord. We do not yet have do not yet have information on what will be planned for a memorial uh, for John. May we bow together. Father, thank you again for this opportunity. Lord, we live in such a troubled world. Our world is like a raging sea right now. 
it is very easy. We ride the waves of this troubled world to be tossed about. We are bombarded by anguish, by anger, by rage, by falseness. We are bombarded by fear. Lord, there is so much around us that is absolutely outside of our control. There's actually very little that we can control. But Lord, you are the sovereign God. This world is not abandoned. This is your world. Planet Earth is yours. You are in control. And you are good. And Father, history is moving as you have determined that it will move. And it, will, and it is moving towards a glorious, glorious future. A future in which all things will be made new. A future in which sin and death and pain and mourning and disease and all the things that rage around us will be no more. Lord Jesus, you are the King. You reign now. And one day, Lord, your reign will be complete and it will be literally upon the earth. And that day when all things are made new. And we thank you and praise you, Lord. We have hope with confidence to the good that you have. And not only in the distant future, we look forward to the, with confidence to the good you have for each of us in our lives right now. Thank you. Father, we would pray right now for Johnny Elgin's family, for Terry, their sons, their daughters, their grandchildren, other family members who are visiting. We would pray for your comfort. We would pray for your encouragement. We would pray for strength physically, emotionally, spiritually through this time. We would pray for your guidance as they move forward. Now, Father, we come needing to be fed. We, we come, and may we come hungry and, and longing to hear your voice, Lord. And so it is with anticipation now that we open your word to hear your words. And we pray this in your precious name. Amen. I invite you to open your Bible to the Gospel of John as we are continuing our look at this wonderful witness to Jesus that is John's Gospel account. We're coming into a new section. We're coming into a new ten. The location is still the same. Um, it's one of the unique features of John, that John's gospel moves through only just a very few locations. And we are in, still in the same place where we've been. The, the setting for the words that you are about to hear are Jerusalem. G Jesus is still there. He's in Jerusalem at this time. Following on the heels of uh, healing of the blind man and the conflict and controversy that, that followed that in, in, in chapter 9. So we're going to pick it up in chapter 10, beginning in verse 1. I tell you the truth. Note again that Jesus begins with an emphatic emphasis. We've noticed this expression before in John where Jesus repeatedly uses it. And when Jesus says, I tell you the truth, or in your Bible it may say, truly, truly, that is a that is an expression of emphasis. It's calling those who are hearing to listen up. Listen up. I tell you the truth, the man who does not enter the sheep pen by the gate but climbs in by some other way. The man who enters by the gate is the shepherd of the sheep. The watchman opens the gate for him, and the sheep listen to his voice. He calls his own sheep by name and leads them out. When he has brought out all his own, he goes on ahead of them, and his sheep follow him because they know his voice. But they will never follow a stranger. In fact, they will run away from him because they do not recognize a stranger's voice. Jesus used this figure of speech. 
But they did not understand what he was telling them. Therefore Jesus said again, I tell you the truth, I am the gate for the sheep. All who ever came before me were thieves and robbers, but the sheep did not listen to them. I am the gate. Whoever enters through me will be saved. He will come in and go out and find pasture. The thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy. I have come that they may have life and have it to the full. I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. The hired hand is not the shepherd who owns the sheep. So when he sees the wolf coming, he abandons the sheep and runs away. Then the wolf attacks the flock and scatters them. The man runs away because he is a hired hand and cares nothing for the sheep. I am the good shepherd. I know my sheep, and my sheep know me. Just as the Father knows me, and I know the Father, and I lay down my life for the sheep. I have other sheep that are not of this sheep pen, and I must bring them also. They too will listen to my voice, and there shall be one flock and one shepherd. The reason my father loves me is that I lay down my life, only to take it up again. No one takes it from me, but I lay it down of my own accord. I have authority to lay it down, and authority to take it up again. This command I receive from my father. This is the word of the Lord. Do you know, do you know how much he loves you. You know how ne this passage reminds me again of how absolutely unique, and I think as Christians we sometimes don't realize how absolutely unique Christianity is. How absolutely unique is the message, the good news that we have to bring. We have the message of, of a God who declares his love for sinners, for those who have literally rebelled against him. Do you know how much he loves you? Oh, this text speaks to that. Do you know what he has done to This text speaks to that. Do you know how, how secure you are with him? This text speaks to that. We have come to one of the most wondrous and beautiful descriptions of our Lord and, and our relationship with him. And it is all built on a on a picture, a picture we need to understand, that of the shepherd and his sheep. So just very briefly, some, some background that we need to see. When, when Jesus uses this picture, these, this word picture that he draws for his hearers here, of the, the shepherd, the sheepfold, the door, the gate, the shepherd's very familiar to the people who would be hearing him in first century Palestine. Very, very familiar to them. And, and especially in that, in that part of the country, Judea was, Judea, the southern part of, of the land, Judea was, was sheep country. It wasn't really good for much else. It wasn't good for agriculture. It wasn't good for raising crops. They did that farther in the north, Samaria and Galilee, but not so much. It's dry, it's arid, but it's good for sheep. You don't need a lot of grass, and there was enough grass there for them. So it was very much sheep country. And every town, every village, would you would find a sheepfold. You would find sheep, and you would find shepherds. So when Jesus is speaking these words, he's, he's using a metaphor, he's using a word picture that immediately has identification with the people around him. And actually, for a long time before this, going back into the Old Testament, God had used the imagery of shepherd and sheep to describe, to describe his relationship with Israel. Many times in the Old Testament, God described his relationship with Israel with this, with this same imagery. Just a couple of examples. In Psalm 80 and verse 1, the psalmist directing prayer to God says, Hear us, shepherd of Israel, you who lead Joseph like a flock, who sit enthroned between the cherubim, 
shine forth. Psalm 79, verse 13. Then we, your people, the sheep of your pasture, will praise you forever. From generation to generation, we'll, we will proclaim your praise. And we just sort of sang the words earlier from, from Psalm 100. We are your people. We are the sheep of your pasture. God, throughout the Old Testament, used this rich image of sheep and shepherd to describe himself and his relationship to Israel. And then, of course, most famously of all, David described his relationship to God as one of sheep to shepherd in his famous 23rd Psalm, saying, The Lord, the Lord is my shepherd. Now this is all about Jesus and his followers. And so we see, we're going to see three things. There's actually four on your sheet, but we're not going to, we're not going to get to the fourth. This is all about Jesus. And so first we're going to see the shepherd's relationship to his sheep. The shepherd's relationship to his sheep in verses 1 through 6. And the shepherd's, the shepherd's relationship to his sheep was one of familiarity. The shepherd's relationship to his sheep was, was one of familiarity. I was looking at a, a book that gives a lot of background to things in the New Testament, and the, the, the writer uh, gives this description. Jewish shepherds kept their sheep in two kinds of sheepfolds. If they were out in the country, the sheepfold was like a low-walled corral made of stone with a narrow opening in front. If they were in town, the fold was much bigger and structurally sounder, and it was a communal corral often it had a professional gatekeeper. The communal corral, the corral that would be in the, the communal corral is the image our Lord referred to here. He pictured the shepherd coming up to the corral, his automatic recognition by the gatekeeper, his admission into the fold, and his walk among the multitude of mixed flocks. To the uninitiated, that would look like an insoluble problem for the shepherd, but the shepherd would begin to talk to the sheep in a characteristic sing-song way to which only his sheep would respond. In this way, he would separate out his flock. The shepherd's relationship to his sheep was one of familiarity. And notice the statement in, that Jesus makes in verse 3. He says, the watchman opens the gate for him, for the shepherd, and the sheep Listen to his voice. The sheep listen to his voice. They, they are familiar with them, with him. And he says, he calls, and he calls his own sheep by name. Isn't that fascinating? The sheep recognize his voice, and he calls his own sheep by name. Come here, long ears. <laughs> Come here, stubby tail. Come here, punk one. <laughs> I don't know what, what names a Jewish shepherd might have for his sheep. But he had names for them. He had names for them. And they recognized their names. And you see this, you see this image of, of familiarity. The shepherd and the shepherd's relationship. It is a very familiar relationship. They know his voice and he calls them by name. They are known to him, and they know him. He calls them by name. And this, this shows how much he knows us. This shows how much he knows us. When you drop down, you see Jesus' words in, in verses 14 and 15. I am the good shepherd. I know my sheep, the emphasis. I know my sheep, and my sheep know me just as the Father knows me, and I know the Father. Now, that is the, Jesus is putting a great emphasis there. He's saying, it's not just that I know my sheep, I know my sheep as the Father knows me. That means intimately. That means the Father knows Jesus intimately. The Father knows 
everything about Jesus. The Father knows there is nothing about his Son that the Father does not know. Jesus says, that's, that's how I know my sheep. I know my sheep with, with intimate knowledge. Jesus knows our, our past. He knows your past. He knows the failures. He knows the hurts. He knows the disappointments. He knows the regrets. He knows our present. He knows your struggles. He knows the things that are really hard. He knows the sins that you have great difficulty overcoming. He knows your dreams. He knows your future. His, his knowledge of you is, is not limited by, 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 by time. He knows your past. He knows your present. He knows your future. He, he, he knows us. He says, I, I know my sheep. I know them intimately. And he emphasizes in verse 4, and again in, in verse 14, he says, and, and my sheep know me. I, I call them, and they recognize my voice. I call them, and they recognize my voice. The sheep know him. And the relationship, the relationship that they have, the relationship of the, of the sheep to the shepherd is, 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 is that they follow him. Verse 4. When he has brought out all of his own, he goes on ahead of them, and his sheep follow him because they know his voice. They follow them. They, they follow him. He, he leads them. He emphasizes it again in verse 5, but they will, never, they will never follow a stranger. I want you to just linger on those words. My sheep follow me. My sheep follow me. It's one of the big differences between the way sheep are raised, even today in the Middle East. If you go to the Middle East, in a number of countries, you will find Bedouin, Arab um, shepherds out there, and they are doing exactly what is described here. And one of the differences between raising sheep and how that works in the Middle East, both then and now compared to say in Australia where they raise a lot of sheep or different places in the United States is, is that here oft, oftentimes there will be a sheep dog who will go out and he will sort of corral the sheep and, and he will drive them as it were he will drive them to where the shepherd wants them to be or the owner wants them to be but not so here the sheep are not driven the sheep are always led and the sheep Jesus said and my sheep follow me and let those follow me. How do you know if you are one of his sheep? Do you follow him? You see, that is the difference between an empty profession that names the name of Jesus but results in no life change and the reality of actually being his sheep Jesus said, my sheep, follow me. They hear my voice, and they follow me. That's a characteristic of being his sheep. It's not about perfection. There is no perfection in this life, but it is about obedience, and a characteristic of his sheep is that they, they follow him. In verse 6, you can come to the end of this section. It's interesting. I'm editorially makes the comment, Jesus used this figure of speech, but they did not understand what he was, that they did not understand. They understood the picture. He was talking about shepherd and sheep, but they did not understand the meaning. So first of all, Jesus, Jesus speaks of the relationship, his relationship to the sheep, and it is one of intimate knowledge. It is one in which his sheep know him, and he knows them, and he leads them. And then secondly, we see Jesus speaks Jesus speaks of the shepherd's provision for his sheep. The shepherd's provision for his sheep in verses 7 through 10. Verse 7, therefore Jesus said again, I tell you the truth, I am the gate, I am the gate 
for the sheep. I am the gate for the sheep. What does it mean? What does it mean? What does Jesus mean by calling himself the, the gate for the sheep? G. Campbell Morgan was one of the most well-known uh, evangelical preachers of the early, of 20th, early 20th century in England. And he made a trip to what was what is today Israel. He, he made a trip to, to the Holy Land. And he was traveling one day with, with a guide. And he came across a shepherd and his sheep. And he fell into conversation with the shepherd. And the man showed him the fold into which the sheep were led at night. It consisted of four walls uh, with, with one way in. And Morgan said to him, that is where they go at night. Yes, said the shepherd. And when, they, and when they are in there, they are perfectly safe. But there is no door, said Morgan. I am the door, said the shepherd. Now the shepherd was not a Christian man. He was not speaking the native language of the New Testament. But he was speaking from an Arab shepherd's standpoint. And Morgan looked at him and said, what do you mean by the door? And the shepherd said, when the light has gone out and all the sheep are inside, I lie in the open space and no sheep goes out but across my body and no wolf comes in unless he crosses my body. I am the door. What a wonderful picture. What a wonderful picture. Jesus said, I am the gate. I am the door. My sheep are in my sheepfold, and I am the gate, and I am the door. In order to go into the fold, you must go through him. If you are going to be his sheep, and you're going to be in his sheepfold, you must go through him. He is the door. There is no other door. There is no other way into his sheepfold but through him. It's like over in the Gospel of Matthew when he, he says, it, it's like this, there is, there is a broad way, there is a broad road, and many are on it, that, and that road leads to destruction, and there is a narrow way that leads to life, and few find it. There is no other way in there. There is no other way to be in his sheepfold, but through him. You must go through him. There simply is no other way. And again, in our text, you see his emphasis on this in verse 9. I am the gate, and whoever enters through me will be saved. If you come into the sheepfold via Jesus, you're going to be saved. You're going to be safe. You're going to be safe. You're going to be secure. As the door, as the gate, he is both provider, he is both protector. He is both protector and he is provider. When you come in the door through Jesus, you're safe. There's no thief that's going to be able to get past him. There's no robber, there's no wolf that's going to snatch you away from him. And when you go out, he says, when you go out through Jesus, you go, he says, and my sheep go in and out and find pasture. When you go out through Jesus, when you go out, he's going to take care of you. He's going to provide for you. He's going to meet, he's going to meet your needs. He is the great provider. He said, not only are my sheep secure, but my sheep find pasture through me. They're nourished through me. They're nourished because of the way that I lead them and the places that I lead them to. And I'm always going to be nourishing them. And he is, he is the great provider of the sheep. Look at verse 10. The huge contrast. The thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy. I have come that they may have life and have it to the if you know Jesus as your shepherd, if you know Jesus as your shepherd, what is he providing for you? He is providing life to the full, not just existence, not just survival, not just eking it out. He says, those who come to me have abundant life. They have life to the full. Oh, what a great promise. He is the great provider. 
And yes, the reality is there are dangers that the sheep face. There are dangers. The text opens by talking about that in verse 1. I tell you the truth, the man who does not enter the sheep pen by the gate, but climbs in the way, is a thief and a robber. Yes, there are thieves and there are robbers, and the two words are a little bit different. The, the word thief uh, denotes someone who, who, who comes to steal. The word robber denotes someone who comes to steal with violence. And there are thieves, and, 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 and there are dangers, and there are robbers out there. And he emphasizes it again in, in verse 8. And this is interesting how he puts it in verse 8. All who ever came before me were thieves and robbers, but the sheep did not listen to them. Who were those thieves and robbers? Well, I think if you just read back over the previous chapter, you can the previous chapters, you can identify the thieves and the robbers that he has in mind. The thieves and robbers were, in fact, the very people who supposedly were responsible for caring for the people of God. The thieves and the robbers were the very people who should have been protecting the people of God. But the thieves and the robbers were, in fact, the religious establishment of Israel. The very ones that Jesus has come in conflict with, the very ones who in the previous chapter we, we saw their anger and their rage it, it expressed in him. They are the ones who, in, a, in another place, Jesus said to them, you lay heavy burdens upon people. You weigh them down in your legalistic system, but you will not lift a finger to, to help in one of those burdens. The thieves and the robbers that Jesus is referring to here are actually religious leaders and the religious establishment of that day. He said, they don't care for the sheep. And he said, my sheep know that. My sheep recognize that. And today, my friends, there are thieves and robbers. There are false teachers. There are thieves and robbers today who desire to lead you down a false path to exploit, to exploit God's people for their own end. There are dangers, and the shepherd is aware of that. The shepherd is aware of that. That warning in our text is not just for the first century. It's for the 21st century. Now I have a third part here, if you're looking at your outline, and that is that Jesus shows us the shepherd's heart for the sheep. But there is so much there that I don't want to try to go into that section. I'm going to leave that. We're just going to make that next week's sermon, the shepherd's heart for his sheep, verses 11 through 18. That's where Jesus, for the first time in John, begins to talk in a very straightforward way. He begins to talk about his death. And he begins to talk not only about his death, but the purpose of his death. And how his death, in fact, is necessary for his sheep. So we're going to save that for next week. I want to conclude with a question, though, that you have there on that outline. Do you know? Do you know that you are a sheep and you have a shepherd? Do you know you are a sheep and you have a shepherd? Again, the words of, of Psalm 100 and verse 3. Going back into ancient times, God described his relationship with his people in these words, we are his people, the sheep of his pasture. Well, just, just a little side note before we leave this. Um, there's so much beauty and there's so much, you know, beauty and, and warmth in that imagery, isn't there? Of the, the sheep and the shepherd's care for him. But if you just think about, just, just don't think about the shepherd-sheep relationship right now. Just think about the sheep. To be called a sheep is not really a compliment. Sheep are not really bright. They're not really bright. In fact, they act in some really stupid ways. They're really, really good at, at getting themselves into, into trouble. Dr. Bob Smith was a longtime professor of philosophy at, at, at Bethel College, and he made this comment at, at, at one time. He said, um, the existence of sheep, the existence of sheep are the most obvious argument against the survival of the fittest. 
The existence of sheep are the most obvious argument against the Darwinian concept of the survival of the fittest, because sheep really don't survive very well, left to themselves. You may have read his, his, his books. There are wonderful books to read uh, by a man named Philip Keller. He was a shepherd himself, and he wrote a wonderful book called A Shepherd Looks at the 23rd Psalm, and another one called A Shepherd Looks at the Good uh, a shepherd looks at the good shepherd, but he talks about one of the one of the ways in which sheep are, uh, I mean, helpless. He said uh, there's a phenomenon that happens with sheep. You know, sheep, not lambs, now sheep. They're they're big. You know, they get kind of big. They get kind of heavy. They're kind of woolly. And if one of those sheep falls over on its side and it tries to get up, what it will often do, and what this phenomenon is called, the sheep is cast, that's the term shepherds use for, the sheep is cast, the, 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 the sheep gets down on its side, and it tries to get up, what it ends up doing is rolling over on its back. Well, when it rolls over on its back, its center of gravity is right in the middle, its four legs are sticking up, and it cannot get up. Now, is that a picture of helplessness? On its back, four legs sticking up. It can't get up. It is absolutely helpless. And of course, if if there's not a shepherd around to protect, it is extremely vulnerable at that point. So we we are a sheep. Well, one of the things that says about us is that we're needy. Sheep are, are needy, and we're needy. Sheep are dependent, and we're dependent. Sheep need a shepherd, and we need a shepherd. And in Isaiah 53, it says, All we like sheep have gone astray. All we like sheep have gone astray. And we need a shepherd. And the shepherd we have is not just a good shepherd. He's a great shepherd because he's a shepherd who literally laid down his life in order to rescue, to protect, to save. You called yourself the shepherd. And not only the shepherd, but the gate. You are the shepherd who is the gate. You are the shepherd who is the very means by which the sheep enter the sheepfold. There is no other way. You are the shepherd who knows us intimately, who knows his sheep intimately by name. There's nothing about us that you don't know. Oh, how comforting that is. In a world in which we feel often misunderstood and misplaced and and feeling like no nobody really knows yes you know you care you you are the shepherd who knows the sheep and you know our names and you call us by name and you lead us and you provide for us and you protect us and father we have all of this this wonderful reality of what this means we have all of this Solely by your grace. We are not your sheep because of something we've done. We are your sheep because you have called us by grace to be your sheep. We can take no credit. But oh, what a privilege and what a joy and what a security it is to know that we are yours, that we are held by our shepherd, that we are cared for. Let's stand together as we close, just reflecting on those words that Pastor just closed in his prayer, that Jesus is there holding us. He will hold it in us.
God for that good news. We now receive the Lord's benediction from Hebrews 13, verses 20 and 21. Now may the God of grace, who through the blood of the eternal covenant brought back from the dead our Lord Jesus, that great shepherd of the sheep, may he equip you with everything good for doing his will, and may he work in us what is pleasing to him through Jesus Christ, to whom be glory forever and ever. Amen. God bless you.